This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can have your voice heard regarding the child welfare system. I am Dennis Lawrence, and today, Maria, what do we have on tap today? We would like to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in this week. On Friday, April 29, 2016, Wayne County's Third Circuit Court held a show cause hearing in the case of Shannon DeBacker versus Michael Lewis. Case number 0915455-DS. Jan DeBacker, the mother of Shannon DeBacker, was the only person attending the hearing to support her daughter. She watched in horror in the courtroom as her daughter Shannon was falsely charged with contempt of court by Judge Martha Snow. Her daughter was then handcuffed, escorted out of the court, locked up and falsely imprisoned for the first time in her entire life, all because Shannon had declined the judge's appointment of attorney. And because Shannon had assisted on representing herself to the court as a natural and sane person. Here at Michigan for Parental Rights, we've been following the Shannon's case for some time now. Uh, it all started weeks prior to her daughter's Jana's birth date of July 15th to now, 2009 when Shannon had gone to Oakwood Hospital emergency room in a full-term pregnancy. While she was there the doctors and medical staff induced labor but Shannon was ultimately sent home before delivery. At home a rupture occurred and as a result baby Jana was deprived of oxygen. She was next subject to a botched surgical procedure and born with cerebral palsy. For the past few years since Jana's birth, the court and other government actors have been incrementally and systematically taking custody away from Shannon DeBacker under false pretenses. They have been constructing a fraudulent paper trail of lies and cover-ups and covering up the alleged criminal activity of the baby's father. So as to bring the case to a final conclusion that neither parent is fit to manage the life and the lucrative malpractice settlement money. There is a multi-million dollar medical malpractice lawsuit against the medical community for Jana being born clinically dead and only being revived to the point of having to live with the worst type of cerebral palsy for the rest of her life. I would like to thank the Rico Busters for furnishing this video with the scoop of the corruption in Wayne County, Michigan. Note that the implicit or explicit mentioning or naming of individuals in this video does not constitute a formal allegation or claim of guilt. All are presumed innocent until proven guilty in a competent court of law. The trouble is, such a level of competence within the Charter County of Wayne, Michigan is impossible to find when the court system and child protective services have been taken over by domestic terrorists. Welcome to Rico Busters. This intense segment covers the story of Shannon DeBacker, a woman who has been victimized by the Wayne County Circuit Court, Family Court, Friend of the Court, and CPS system for the past seven years. Her story began with the filing of a medical malpractice lawsuit in 2009 after the medical community in Michigan completely botched the delivery of her newborn baby, Jana, causing the child to be first born clinically dead and then revived only to such extent that the child will have the most severe form of cerebral palsy for the rest of her life. 
Shannon's story is about a multi-million dollar case against doctors in a hospital, a case which was subsequently ransacked and railroaded from the local government, being judges, child protective services, friend of the court, and CPS decided to get involved and work with the hospitals to drive a wedge between the severely disabled child and her parents, so to take over the child's yet unsettled trust to state to appear incompetent to manage the exceptionally large financial purse of the child needed for the rest of Jana's natural life. This video picks up from a story recently published by the Voice of Detroit Independent Online Newspaper. The article, posted the evening of Sunday, May 1st, 2016, with a joint writing venture of Cornell Squires, founder of We the People for the People, who is co-founder of Rico Busters along with investigative journalist David Scheid, which is me told of how just the previous Friday in court, Shannon DeBacker's mother watched with horror as Shannon was treated with contempt by a judge charging her with contempt and having her bound in handcuffs, in shackles, and taken from the courtroom to jail for the entire weekend. It was the first time that Shannon had ever been charged or jailed for anything, and it was because she had long been trying to expose that the child's father, a man with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and a long history of reported violence and criminal arrest was a sexual predator doing unconscionable things to his own disabled daughter. So why aren't the agents of the Charter County of Wayne and or the state of Michigan doing anything substantive about these heinous crimes and instead attempting to label Shannon DeBacker as some type of mental case and unfit mother? The answers we are finding point to the plain and simple greed these so-called government officials are trying to pin on this mother as motivation for her making so many reports against the father, who perhaps not so coincidentally, Rico Busters has linked to two medical doctors who have both been found guilty of other medical malpractice allegations. Take the first of these two malpractice doctors, Paul Emerson, who the Drug Enforcement Agency and the U.S. Attorney's Office convicted for illegally distributing prescription drugs, along with a local Flat Rock police officer and a couple of Michael Lewis's close friends. According to Shannon DeBacker, Michael Lewis became the snitch that took down this crooked doctor, Paul Emerson, who was a community drug supplier that was operating along with the crooked cop and others running a profiteering racket that ended up with two of the doctor's patients dead. In a telephone interview, Shannon told me that it goes deeper than that. She said others connected with Michael Lewis have died too, and that the reason law enforcement is covering up Michael Lewis's sex crimes upon his own disabled daughter is to protect his identity as their snitch in the more recent case against yet another crooked doctor with a similar history as Emerson. Dr. Emerson and him became very close personal friends. Dr. Emerson was going to his apartment when he lived in Riverview and was giving him injections and writing him prescriptions while he was wearing a wire. The receptionist that worked for Dr. Emerson at that time, Lisa Byrne, which Mike was dating back then as well, also turned in state's evidence and they began a investigation using Mike and Lisa as the witnesses that enabled them to take Emerson down. Okay, and how did you know that he was wearing a wire and all that stuff? That seems like insider information. Um, yeah, the ex-girlfriend that wrote that affidavit that scared for her life that had to move out of the state. Was that uh, Jer Jerry? Yeah, that was his girlfriend at that time. Hasselbacher yeah. or something like that? Okay. Yes. Uh, and she was with Michael at the time? Yes. Okay. She is, she is to this day so afraid that she won't even speak to me no longer because she is afraid that she's going to end up dead. Okay. Now Dr. Pinson is mysteriously under investigation for the same exact charges and almost the same exact charges. And I believe that Michael is in the process of getting his current doctor taken down in return for my daughter being abused. 
holy crud, Batman. That means that he's a snitch on both doctors. And it looked like law enforcement of Gotham City and Wayne County is protecting a child molester and striking deals with Michael Lewis. Yes, Robin, it does look like local detectives and county prosecutors are taking advantage of Lewis's purported mental health deficiencies, his drug addictions, and his long history of criminal tendencies to help them round up crooked doctors that are the foster parents to a drug-infested Michigan community. And that's why the Wayne County prosecutor refuses to prosecute Michael Lewis, even when on rare occasions such as this, when honest police officers step over the thin blue line and tell the truth. Yes, the truth that a disabled, innocent seven-year-old child, soon to become a millionaire thanks to this medical malpractice lawsuit, has communicated in the best way she can to mother, grandmother, and the police that her sicko father, Michael Lewis, is sexually exploiting, molesting, and raping her with his fingers. So, the real bad guys are the ones that are supposed to be protecting the city of Detroit and the people of the county. It's all the familiar faces. Kim Worthy, Warren Evans, and his mentor, Robert Ficano, who also used to be a Wayne County Sheriff before the Wayne County Executive. It's the doctors, Child Protective Services, and the local police detectives in multiple cities. It's the Wayne County judges, Lombard, Dingle, and this latest one, Martha Snow, and the past two chief judges of the Third Circuit Court, Robert Colombo, and, and Virgil Smith, whose son, the Michigan Senator, also had multiple previous arrests, only to get unaccountable slaps on the wrist by Prosecutor Kim Worthy before he finally went nuts after his formal girlfriend with a shotgun. So, Batman, it's too overwhelming. The entire county has been taken over by domestic terrorists. Do you think we might need some help with this one? You're right, Robin. We need help from every outraged person in the community to stand up against the tyranny of the corporatized government usurpers taking over here as the Charter County of Wayne. It's time for us to unite. We need Rico Busters. Let's go. So how do we the people take down a corporatized government oligarchy that doesn't work except to unconstitutionally serve itself? It's a system with familiar faces and names, with a freely revolving door between branches of government that wipes out all constitutionally mandated checks and balances otherwise designed by the framers to provide every American with due process and proper access to the courts that aren't jury rigged. And how do we instead rebuild a new government system that works for us, that is not self-regulating, self-investigating, and self-reporting? One that has a high level of personal accountability in office that reaches both civil and criminal penalties for breaches of oaths and duties to we the people. These are questions that are going through Shannon DeBacker's mind as she is compelled to deal with a system that protects criminals and fosters child molestation and sodomy and throws outraged and protesting mothers and others behind bars to coerce them into submitting to this tyranny. Shannon is finding her own answers in the mountains of documents that she has saved in the past seven years since the botched birth of her daughter caused by the hospital and its associated medical team of doctors. What she has found is appalling, which is why she, like we, have become a Rico buster, out to take out the corruption herself because those under our employ are simply selling her and all of us out. Her findings are threatening to both the medical and the legal systems, which is why they see no evil, hear no evil, and say no evil, and instead interpret Ms. DeBacker's findings and persistent advocacy as signs of her own mental and emotional instability. I ask myself, and answer affirmatively, wouldn't I be a basket case too if my defenseless child were being regarded as less than human, as a sex tool for a pedophile father, as a meal ticket for state CPS workers and attorneys, and as a source of federal funding by the agents of various courts and state organizations? The fact is that as the Voice of Detroit article points out, 
Shannon DeBacker was jailed by the Flint water crisis negligent Governor Snyder appointed Judge Martha Snow. For what? For violating two court orders. First, for following a medical professional's own handwritten order for her not to to release the child freely to the father of the child's suspected perpetrator and because there was an open investigation on this pedophilia matter. Second, Snow jailed Shannon because she had issued a wrongful judicial order herself forbidding Shannon from taking this child to any more medical facilities, regardless of whether she suspected another assault upon her daughter or not unless she first asked permission from the perpetrator to seek medical attention. To those of us who were sitting quietly watching from the public gallery of the courtroom, the proceedings were rigged against Shannon. It was clear that the perpetrator's, um, the father's attorney had implied that there was more harm in returning the child, Jana Lewis, back to her mother than allowing her to remain with her client for another couple of weeks when an evidentiary hearing had been scheduled. That two-week delay was because Judge Martha Snow could not somehow find enough urgency in this entire matter to hold the evidentiary hearing on the spot with several third-party witnesses that were certainly available and ready to testify that very day if it meant saving Janet from more of this sexual abuse. The father's attorney actually fraudulently implied that she had done research before this particular hearing, telephoning CPS, friend of the court, the Taylor police, and the Southgate police, and found either no interest by these agencies and departments in returning her calls, or that they returned notice to her that there was no investigation open and no concern about the integrity of her client. Oh, really? Let's see. Here's a letter from the Taylor Police that Michigan Attorney Audrey Stroya stated on the record as an officer of the court did not bother to return her call. I'll have you know that Shannon and I both went to these police detectives in Taylor after she got out of jail and got word from them that they had never received such a phone call from Stroya and that if they had, they would have reported there to be an open investigation on these allegations against Michael Lewis pertaining to his disabled daughter. In fact, after we left the detectives, we got word that they telephoned Judge Martha Snow to notify her personally that such an investigation was indeed open, and yet Snow still did nothing about it. Here's another letter from the friend of the court also stating that they had opened an investigation on the pedophilia and abuse allegations three full weeks before Judge Snow placed the child in harm's way with the alleged perpetrator and jailed Shannon DeBacker instead for decrying years of their ignoring her screams for help on behalf of her daughter. Go figure. So why would a judge by the way, this was the judge put into place by the illustrious Michigan governor now being accused of having a leading role of gross negligence in the poisoning of scores of innocent children in Flint. I say again, why would such a judge treat this attorney Stroya with such honor while treating a mother such as Shannon DeBacker, who is standing also before her and before us in the court, but forcibly placed into a prison jumpsuit and with hands shackled behind her back as if she were some kind of animal, and after having sole credit herself as judge for having placed this woman in the outrageous and dangerous circumstance, we refer to the recent Voice of Detroit article for the answer. Apparently, at one of the preceding hearings, this judicial usurper, Martha Snow, had let the cat out of the bag, and in gloating fashion, that Michael Lewis's attorney, Audrey Stroya, was her mentor. This admission, about which Shannon DeBacker and her mother both heard Snow say in open court, goes beyond conflict of interest and beyond judicial misconduct to criminal tyranny and domestic terrorism. Take a closer look at the decor of this courtroom. In particular, let's look at the open defacing of the American flag. As we zoom in on this flag, we see that there's a yellow banner draped over the sacred symbol of our republic. You know, 
the republic for which it stands, and you can see that this flag and pole don't stand for anything more in this courtroom other than as something for this judge to hang her membership banner to the Women's Lawyers Association of Michigan. I've seen others here blatantly draped over the flag in other courtrooms here in the circuit court operated by domestic terrorists operating as the Charter County of Wayne. This is not a courtroom where constitutional rights are being honored or guaranteed as sworn by the oath of this imposter judge. This is a corporate hijacking of the state judicial system by corporate usurpers of our government power and authority. How many of our fathers, sons, daughters, and mothers have died in battle and serving our country only to see the traditional symbol of our national freedom covered up by this judge's egotistical pride in her membership in a private club? One in which a sexual predator's counsel and her sister attorney is her mentor? Oh, look! Audrey Stroy is a member of the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan, too. Is all this one big coincidence? Hell no. Take a look at this address. 13260 Sticks Toledo Road. Oh my. That's just down the street from, guess who? Dr. Benson, the malpractice drug doctor. The one on probation who diagnosed Michael Lewis as a schizophrenic. See? Benson's address is 13636 Dix Toledo Road practically right next door to Audrey Stroya, and according to this 2012 blog, is handing out narcotic drug prescriptions like candy. And look, his candy store is making nearly a million and a quarter a year. And check it out, he's operating a business with someone named Susan Stroya. Who's that? Why, she's the daughter of Audrey Stroya, the attorney. I wonder if Audrey Stroya was the one representing Pinson when he went before the medical review board and got sanctioned. And it looks like he's even married to Susan Stroya. In any event, we now have the closed chain of connections between the accused child predator Michael Lewis all the way to the mentor of the judge that falsely incarcerated Shannon DeBacker, Audrey Stroya who in the 1980s used to be a judge before going through that revolving door into the private practice of law. I wonder if these attorneys will ever get their practices perfected. I doubt it. It should be simple. All the rules of law are already spelled out. They just need to stop painting over them with so many shades of gray. So stay tuned because our newest Rico buster Shannon DeBacker is not done with her investigation yet. She does not intend to give up on this war against the domestic terrorists operating corporately as the Charter County of Wayne. There is still hope for her daughter as long as this godly innocent child is still active and Shannon is back out from her false incarceration to fight for her. Our next segment on this DeBacker Lewis story will reveal how the sinister plan unfolding around Janet's multi-million dollar lawsuit mimics the pattern of actions that have taken place for decades, as shown in the case of Lynette and Mylani Williams. We can prove that state actors operating the Wayne County Circuit Court have a multi-decade history of covering up domestic terrorism, as it involves courtroom tyranny child kidnappings, the hiding of facts, and the false incarceration of outraged mothers such as found with Shannon's and Jana's medical malpractice cases involving large sums of money. Next time we'll show you, as the jury these mothers never ever seem to otherwise get access to, other than through this alternative media court of public opinion, We'll answer the questions of why it is likely that there are multiple case numbers spanning multiple years in the same child custody action, and what can happen when there are multiple case numbers for medical records pertaining to the same case. We'll show you the Wayne County Circuit Court's register of actions that, as a matter of pattern and practice, have been altered by the clerk of the court, Kathy Garrett, another operant in this domestic terrorist ring. 
We'll also show you medical records that have been altered and falsified to cover up medical findings that otherwise incriminate Michael Lewis as the alleged perpetrator of sex crimes against his daughter, and which otherwise frame Shannon DeBacker as an equally incompetent parent so that to enable the state to take over the multi-million dollar trust that is about to be settled on Janet's behalf with a court-appointed guardian ad litem. We'll show you insurance overbilling by doctors and hospitals and how the medical facilities mandated by the state-run courts, conservators, and CPS for evaluating the child and family appear to be engaging in Medicaid and Social Security fraud. We'll show you how the policy and practice of state child protective services and friends of the court agencies blatantly violate the Constitution, the laws, the court rules, etc and cover their acts up through the falsification of official court documents, creating a history that never occurred so to justify the kidnapping of children from their homes and the collection of federal funding to support their illicit child trafficking and money addictions. We'll also elaborate further on how and why local, state, and federal law enforcement is turning a blind eye on the sexual assaults against Jana Lewis, covering up Michael Lewis's long criminal history so that they might continue using Michael as their snitch and benefit from state and federal grant programs that may be designed to hide sex crimes under the auspices of previous unrelated criminal cases. Until then, see our website for the latest and become a Rico Buster yourself. We need you. Uh, this was just another terrible family corruption where CPS and the family court and custody was involved in the state of Michigan and, and this goes on nationwide. Folks, the thing is, speak out and let others know what is going on in this system. Don't let your voice be silent. I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make a difference. difference.